Hello, gardeners, and thank you for joining us for Mid-American Gardener. We are here to talk about all things in the out-of-door plants, not animals, but mostly plants, turf, who knows? We'll find out what we're going to talk about. We have some emails and hopefully some of your calls. My name is Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. So I might handle some cut flowers or maybe perennial questions, but we have three sharp talented folks here today. <laughs> Let's find out their expertise and a little bit about it, and they're gonna do some show and tell or emails. Let's start with you first, Chuck Voigt. Hi, Diane. I'm Chuck Voigt. I recently retired from the Department of Crop Sciences. My specialties are vegetables and herbs, but I can venture beyond that if need arises. Uh, tonight I brought uh, some show and tells that I, that I went out to the store and, and found. Uh, I know the last time I was here we were talking about you know what can we what can we still plant for the fall garden well I think these are kind of borderline but I think we probably could still get away with with uh, bok choy which uh, grows pretty pretty rapidly and even if it didn't get to this size uh, you know they sell baby bok choys all the time so I think there's probably still time for bok choys uh, at, at this general season of, of, of the year and this I found in the grocery store today and and I love it. It is a red Napa cabbage, which I had never seen, and it upsets me just a little bit uh, that I didn't know it existed. I had <laughs> somehow haven't seen it in a catalog or anything. Uh, so that's one. Uh, it's on my wish list to find next year so that I can, I too can grow it. Uh, but it's it's really nice. And it, this is a Napa. Uh, the taller one is is more of a celery cabbage or a my chili type. We're getting a little late for those uh, as, as we as we move through late summer. Um, so um, <clears throat> hopefully, if you, if you want those, you you've got them going. And if anybody can, can call in, write in, email in, and tell me where to find this rascal, I would appreciate that. So to find the seeds, the to seeds grow. for it. Yes, I, yeah. I, I, I obviously he has the plant. I, I know <laughs> where to, I know where to purchase it at least. <laughs> For now, but a lot of us like to grow things from seed. It's kind of a challenge, yeah. Well, like after or trees after, from cutting. After last year's flood disaster, I uh, I kind of outdid myself this year, trying to prove to myself that I can still grow <laughs> heirloom tomatoes and lots. Of course, of you can. Uh -huh. It was well, just a blip on the screen, <laughs> and you only grow like a thousand varieties. So, I'm yeah, not cut lacking. I've cut down to five hundred. Five <laughs> hundred. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, but you grow a few. All right, thank you, Chuck, very much. And now to the middle, let's go to Candace Miller. Yes, hello, my name is Candace Miller. I'm an extension horticulture educator for U of I Extension, and I serve kind of the northwest corner of the state. I have six counties in the northwest corner. And I specialize really in kind of anything home horticulture related, but especially kind of annuals, perennials, landscape, trees, that kind of, uh, those kind of things. So my first question here is about trees, speaking of trees, and um, this viewer is asking, is it okay to prune back maple trees this time of year? They have some limbs hanging low in their driveway and they plan on cutting some back to main branches. And that's a great question. And you can prune this time of year, but we always recommend that it's better to prune during the dormant season for most types of uh, of trees just for one to avoid possible disease issues. Maples not so much, but definitely oaks. We always recommend that you prune during the growing, uh, not the growing season, the dormant season, um, because when you prune a branch, it can actually attract insects, which can transmit diseases and, and various other things. So if it's possible, it'd be better to wait till the winter when the leaves have fallen off so that you're not transmitting any diseases, but you can also see the framework of the tree a little bit better too. And uh, without the leaves on it, it's a little easier to tell where's the best place to prune in that. So I would wait a little bit if you can. Okay, very but good. First thing in the spring, they, they'll bleed like, maple, yeah. maples bleed like crazy. Very true, so yeah. That, I don't know how much that hurts them, but it certainly is upsetting to mm -hmm. see them just dripping so sap. dormancy yeah. is good. Yeah. Not yeah. too early and yeah. then not, not too, not too get, close to spring either. Yeah, yeah, dormancy and cold weather should do yeah, it if absolutely. you don't get If you think maple syrup serving. time, don't yeah. prune yeah. your ornamental yeah. maples yep. in exactly. your yard because that's they want the sugars from it and you don't yeah. if you want to prune it. Good. Thank you, Candace, yep. very much. 
Now I am going to turn it over to Dr. Tom Voigt next and see what you have for us. Thanks, Diane. It's good to be here tonight. Uh, I'm Tom Voigt and I work with uh, perennial grasses. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Crop Sciences on campus here at the university. And tonight I want to talk about uh, perennial uh, miscanthus species. Uh, as you see on the screen, this is miscanthus sinensis uh, gracilimus or maiden grass. Uh, maiden grass is one of the older varieties of miscanthus. It's been around for many years and it's, it's outstanding because of its fine texture uh, and also because it flowers late. And that, uh, so you, this makes a great backdrop and we'll see a slide in a moment of uh, uh, maiden grass used as a backdrop. With that fine texture, it does not uh, interfere with the with the show that's going on in front of it if you're using it as a, as a backdrop plant. The next is Miscanthus sinensis morning light and this is a much newer introduction but you can see it's uh, still a very fine textured or very narrow bladed grass. Uh, this grass is uh, was brought into this country from Asia probably within the last uh, probably 40 years by uh, the USDA. And it's uh, narrow foliage, but it's got a little a larger white stripe down the leaf. That gives it a little more variegated look than the, the maiden grass has. So it, in fact, is also an, a nice grass to use as a it's a backdrop in mass. And here's maiden grass again, uh, and, and we have some uh, coleus in front of that, and I think you can see that it does make a nice, uh, nice backdrop for, uh, for some showier annuals or perennial plants. One of the things you have to one, uh, be concerned about with maiden grass, however, is nurserymen have, in fact, selected uh, seedlings that look enough like it that they think they can get away selling it. Mm -hmm. So you'd prefer to have a uh, deal with a scrupulous nurseryman that's uh, for sure selling uh, uh, the Miscanthus sinensis gracilimus. Mm -hmm. Well, those pictures are great and very timely because didn't you just take them those a moment are, ago? Those are hot off the presses. Those are within, <laughs> uh, within the last uh, couple hours. This afternoon I took those. <laughs> they looked great. So thank a, they, you. This is uh, the, the, for warm season grasses. This is the, the show time of the year. That is great. Wonderful. Well, thank you folks for your answers to those questions. Let's go next to a segment called Did You Know? Bamboo is the fastest growing woody plant in the world. It can grow 35 inches in a single day. Does that sound scary to anyone? That's really yeah. <laughs> yeah, Can I? Uh, yes, do, do, please. Bamboo is a grass. So That's, I think we should give it, cut it some slack. Oh, <laughs> but it's 35 inches? Well, but it's sustainable. That makes it, you know, we're using it for furniture, we're using it for flooring, we're using it for fishing poles. There's there's a myriad of uses. As long as so. it doesn't Just sneak. don't plant it where you don't want it. Yeah. Well, sneak unfortunately, we don't neighbors. have a lot of types that, that, that be well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but know which type you're getting, yeah. clump versus mm -hmm. spreading. Because it... Some people I know that those have gone to the neighbors. If you yeah. if you are interested, the Chicago Botanical Garden uh, evaluated a number of uh, bamboos for ornamental use in northern uh, and, and central part of the Excellent. region, and oh, uh, they, you can go online and find a uh, they little do publication. Such a uh, great job about ornamental bamboos. Evaluating mm -hmm. whole entire one species mm -hmm. of plants and yeah. telling good disease resistance. So thank you for bringing about the bamboo. I didn't realize that they had evaluated bamboo because mm -hmm. I'm looking at ornamental flowering plants <laughs> <with it. laughs> look at it online. Okay, so thanks for that. Well, let's go to the phone lines next. And Charlene has a question for us about apples on line two. Hi, Charlene. Hi there, I love your program. Thank you. I have two ornamental crab apple trees in my front yard. Yes. And um, I've been told it has apple scab. Is this going to kill my trees? Should I spray them right now? Or what should I do about this? Okay, who wants to answer apple scab question? Take that one, good okay. question. Um, if you do have a, um, a crab apple that is susceptible to apple scab, more than likely you probably do have uh, apple scab. It's a very common occurrence every year, typically on susceptible apples. So you could certainly spray that tree, but now is too late to do that. It's a preventative spray. So what I would suggest is that you could um, call your extension office and we have a, a book called the Pest Management and the Home Landscape book that we, they could let you know which particular chemical and what time to spray it. Um, but luckily, it's not going to um, the book. <laughs> kill your, this is what the book looks like. Um, luckily, it's not going to kill your, your apple tree, more than likely. It's just going to affect the, 
Um, the aesthetic look of the apples, and you're probably going to have some spotting on the leaves that might stress the tree some. So if, if there were other things happening too, as well as drought and other conditions, then I would get worried. But um, just the apple scab, I, I wouldn't be 100% concerned, but you could certainly think about doing a preventative spray um, the, for next season. And clean then, up thoroughly. Oh yes, definitely clean get, up get the leaves the, when they fall, yeah. the fruits, yeah, exactly. And then if you ever have an occasion to select another tree, yes. another crab apple, look for <coughs> disease resistance. Yeah, that would be the best way to avoid yeah. it. Even the prairie fires in front of Plant Sciences Lab are looking a little a little sad this right. year. And, this and they're, year and they're, they're <laughs> fairly resistant. Yeah. So yeah. I think we got warm and humid fairly early mm -hmm. and, and that and kind of fairly sustained and, and moist yes, yeah and yeah. It, it got going way earlier than sometimes the upside to it those crab apples have thinned out and i've never seen my plants and you know it's supposed to be partially diffused shade but there's a little more light this year under yeah. for some of my <laughs> landscape plantings and things are doing quite well there you go <laughs> and one hasa looks a little hooray bit, for the ground cover but they look a little sunburned <laughs> where they weren't supposed to get that much sun so so wait till next year isn't that a saying for some team anyway anyway yeah. wait for next year <laughs> all right let's go to line three next and Judy has a question and it looks like it's about voles hi Judy what's your question hi uh, thanks for taking my call sure um, I'm pretty sure that I have voles and they started in the neighbor's yard as near as I can tell and now they're in mine and uh, I don't know if there's a way to get rid of them or not. So that's my question. Okay. We're all looking at each other. Hmm. Animals. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Who would like to just jump in on that? Uh, apparently no one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think as, as, as you go into fall and winter, uh, and Tom can back me up or not on this, I would say uh, get the grass cut down fairly low because if you have tall grass going into the winter, it gives them places to make their trails and, and hide. Um, uh, hope, for <laughs> hope for a not very snowy winter because in, under mm -hmm. the snow is, is where they really do their worst damage. Mm -hmm. um, if, they're, if they're forced to be out in the open, uh, then predators can get at them, but if they can hide under the snow, then it's it's more of a problem. Um, I don't know that there's anything you can use outside uh, because yeah. it's just too dangerous with a with a. And can you trap poison. bulls? Or are they too small? You, you might be able to trap them. I yeah, don't know. I don't yeah. know Some folks have mentioned mouse traps, but have it so whatever it is goes in and and it can't be for other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Things. Yeah. Other but wildlife. you have to target the runs and you can't always target it so it's a uh, it's challenging mm -hmm. yeah Could but adopt, the best thing ad adopt an outdoor cat yeah yeah or a dog or something they yeah. they chase them off i mean they they may not do damage to them they may just keep them from settling in right mm -hmm. if they smell a cat around they may yeah. think may go back to the neighbor's yard i have two cats and they <coughs> i am rabbit vole mouse free it's really lovely um the best thing a vole ever did though it um pruned my Siberian iris one winter, oh, yeah. which was very n netted and worked in, and I was able to just transplant it so easily before it died. <laughs> but that's the only, it, I got it to transplant and it didn't die, that's what I'm saying, but that was the only good thing I ever had happen with the vole, because sometimes those are hard, but otherwise it's not a good thing. But no. thank you, Judy, we hope we helped you a little bit with that. <laughs> well, we're gonna go to Karen's question, and she's on line four, and it's about hemlocks. Hi, Karen. Okay, Karen, I think, talk to us, Karen, and turn off your TV. Karen? Uh, uh, I'm not hearing Karen. Okay, do we go to line five? All right, sorry, Karen. Uh, when you call in, listen for my voice and then chat with me, because I think we lost you. Let's go to uh, Julie's question, line five. Hi, Julie, what have you got for us? Hi, Diane. We love your show. Thank you. I have a question for the future. I'm okay. already starting to clear out some of the dead things that have expended themselves this year. A good and idea. I'm looking to get a jump on putting in bulbs for the fall, 
but I was hoping you could tell me the name of the auger that you recommend for drills oh, and I, where I can buy one. I surely can tell you. It's called Power Planter. Uh, we, we really recommended it and gave it as a gift through uh, the station. Uh, you can Google it. It's Power Planter. Uh, the knee walls have a really excellent quality. It's a, a really sturdy one and they have different sizes mm -hmm. and you can put it into a, a drill cordless or otherwise and it works really well. Be careful about rocky soil mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise it works very well. But it's a stronger metal than some that you will find in other certain stores that don't have as high a quality of tools that they could have. Mm -hmm. Knockoffs. Yeah, they look, they yeah. look like the tool you want, but, but they really not. So Power <laughs> Planter is the name of it. So there we go. Okay, so thank you for that, and <coughs> it's great. I really like using yeah, them, and um, you know, but be careful with rocky soil and anything with roots. It will kick back on you, so be careful. Six inches deep for tulips and daffodils, three inches deep for crocus and small bulbs. All right. I was into teacher mode there for a moment. <laughs> All right, let's go to Donna's question, and she's got a question on line six about acorn squash. Hi, Donna. Hi, how are you today? Doing great. Good. Um, my acorn squash are getting plenty of flowers on them, but the flowers die, and then I get no fruit off of them. What's wrong with them? Okay, are you seeing both male and female blossoms? I don't know the difference. Well, a, f a female blossom will have a little baby acorn squash behind it, where the male is just a just a stalk. I've only seen one other baby acorn squash. I've got one acorn squash on it now, but then I've only seen one other baby, and it okay. fell off. Uh, are they in good bright sunlight? No, it's not in real good sunlight. Because yeah, sometimes, if 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 they're not getting the energy. Uh, they, they tend to just keep producing male blossoms and don't get around to females. Um, I had a cousin who was trying to grow one in an apartment a long time ago and uh, he asked me why he wasn't getting pumpkins and I asked a few questions and found out inside he was only getting male blossoms and then he was very flustered because he was pollinating the male blossoms. But um, uh, I think uh, if you can, in future, plant them where they get more sunshine because uh, if they're not getting adequate sunlight, they may not, they may read that as a, as a reason not to put on lots of female blossoms. Okay. And they're so good to eat. Those mm -hmm. are really, uh, that's a great vegetable. They're a better squash than acorns in my opinion, but sure. <laughs> what are your other ones, though? Wow. What would you suggest? Oh, buttercup is 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 a wonderful one. Uh, butternut. I is, like butternut. Butternut I hear is, that one. is That's very good. good. Plus, it's a different species that does it, is not eaten up by cucumber beetles and some of the other things nearly as badly as, as um, acorns and, and some mm -hmm. of the others. Um, some of the delicatas are very good. Like they're a, beautiful. The honey boat with with the striping and and they're only about a pound, so it's it's a it's a nice. Uh, refined portion when you cut it in half as opposed to, you know, an eight pound butternut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sick of this. <laughs> no, the end of the week. I, I, was, I, I tend to overeat as opposed to get sick of it, but yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I do like butternuts. I've grown that one quite a few years. So good. Thank you for uh, starting our conversation on having different kinds of squash. <laughs> well, we're going to go back to the panel and see what I think Chuck has something more for us to see. Yes, and I we'll do. Come back around. I was I was in the produce department and, and I was looking around and I was just pleased as heck to find dandelion greens, uh, salad greens. Uh, they are grown on purpose, if you can believe <laughs> it. Um, and and they've been selected to have these great, you know, twelve inch, eighteen inch leaves, big, big leaves. And I think probably they have less bitterness than just your average average uh, garden variety would have. Uh, dandelions were not an accidental introduction to, to this continent. They were brought on purpose. They were a very popular pot herb uh, back in the day. Uh, bitter greens were, I think, a little more popular in, in that time frame. And they did escape and, and uh, establish. Uh, but even now, I think on some lists, uh, dandelion is in the top 10 of medicinal herbs around the world. We talked with the other things about what's still appropriate to plant, you know, and things like radishes and lettuces and, and spinach, if you've kept the seed cold, 
um, uh, would be okay to, to put out in September. Uh, but other things like uh, <clears throat> mustard greens, turnip greens, they will grow from a seed. Probably within a couple of weeks, you can start thinning them out and, uh, and eating the thinnings. And then within a month, they're going to be big and, and robust. And in the cool fall weather, they're going to be very mild and, and, and very nutritious. And uh, you, can, you can still uh, get a lot out of your garden, particularly because we seem to be having adequate moisture and, and no sign of it going away with, without quite the flooding that we had last year, which is something to forget. Was, I, <laughs> I try, but I can't. Just okay. the sight of my 28 heirloom tomatoes standing in water for three and a half months was not oh, no. wonderful. Mm -hmm. no. Well, good. Those are nice suggestions. Thank you. And they look so great, except maybe the dandelion. But I I'm sure that. that that is a really good thing. <laughs> you might need a little, Sorry, <coughs> Chuck. a little bit of dressing on that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot yeah. of dressing yeah. and a lot good. of other things. <laughs> 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 they fill in with it. <laughs> Break out the really, really good vinegar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Candace, let's go to you next. Okay, my question is about peonies here. And this person is a very old, uh, huge and entangled peony bed that has roots that are almost impossible to divide. And they're asking, how do I deal with that uh, beautiful monster, they're asking. And I wouldn't, I don't really have a great... Uh, easy way to do it, I would say. I think your best bet would probably be a very sharp spade, to be honest. And um, fall is typically the time when you want to um, divide those transplants and either move them to your new location or thin it out. I'm not sure what your, what your goal is there, but yeah, I would just get in there with as sharp of a spade as you can, divide that into smaller pieces, and then, like I said, either move them or um, add them to a new, new location. But I don't have any yeah. really great, they can easy. Be huge. Yeah, I can. Good. Yeah, find somebody young and strong. Because I used to yeah. do this, but you you start back uh, fairly far, and then when you start to identify, you know, roots coming out, just keep going around and down mm -hmm. until you can kind of get get the get whole big, thing to pop up. Yeah, and then and then, and then just be it. fairly ruthless mm -hmm. and divide it into things that have buds and, and yeah and you want at least yeah. a couple buds and roots in each in each section, but and then don't plant them too deep. Yep. A couple inches. Yep. And good full sun where a tree hasn't just been planted to mm -hmm. have shade later. Yeah. So. But, but like she said, it's, it's almost it's perfect season to do mm -hmm. that. It and, is. And, it is. And again, because of the moisture, the ground is way easier to dig in than it yeah, normally that's true, would be yeah. as, normally as, as, as we go, as we go mm -hmm. through late fall summer. Fall yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. That's a good thing good to question. timely yep. question. All right. Mr. Tom Voigt, you are next. Dr. Voigt. Thank you. Uh, late summer and early fall is a great time of year for lawn work. Uh, particularly now, between, from the middle of August to the middle of September, we look at seeding uh, lawns. Uh, and, and for most of the region, we would certainly recommend planting uh, turf-type tall fescues. If you do have to, uh, if you do have another type of lawn grass, such as Kentucky bluegrass or some of the fine fescues, then it's also a good time to seed those species as well. Uh, we want to make sure that you're watering it uh, and not keeping it soaking wet after you seed. Uh, mulch is a good thing. Uh, straw mulch at the, at the rate of about a bale per thousand square feet is what we would recommend. Uh, clean wheat straw. And, and then uh, providing some fertility after it starts to germinate. Uh, about a five pound uh, application per thousand square feet of a 10-10-10 fertilizer will help it get up and going. So this is a, a time for, for seeding. As we get a little later into the fall, we, we can look at, at weed control, at core aerification, and other lawn, lawn care activities. But right now, it's, it's a good time to seed, and it's a good time to fertilize your uh, normal lawn. And that's why, Tom, we wanted you on right now <laughs> to yeah. remind yeah, so people. It's this is really Labor critical. Day is one of the main holiday it fertilization is. periods, along uh -huh. with Mother's Day, Labor right. Day, and Veterans Day. Don't you think that's easy to remember, which I have to sometimes ask the him, holidays. but still, yeah. Mother's Day, mm -hmm. Veterans Day, Labor Day. La Mother's Day, Labor Day, and Veterans well, Day in yeah, order. In so what, order. what is that, ML, MLV? <laughs> okay, and, there we go. And if you do irrigate your lawn, you really want to fertilize around Flag Day. 
Okay. <laughs> All of the holidays. It's holidays. <laughs> just the holidays. So everyone get on that. T tell yeah. them how soon they should mow seedling grass. That's a really good uh, thought um, because people are afraid to hurt their new little grass plants. Mm -hmm. And so they let them grow way too large before they be, uh, begin mowing. And so if you're going to maintain your lawn at two and a half or three inches, which is the height we would recommend, sometime before it hits four inches, you want to mow it the first time. Because so you don't shade out the young seedlings that are germinating and you also, uh, that mowing causes the grass plant to thicken up and to make more tillers. So, mm -hmm. so by mowing, mowing uh, shortly after uh, germination, you can enhance the thickness of the lawn as well as not shade out new seedlings. So you're not going to hurt those little seedlings. No, they're get they're, in there. They're tough. Yeah, I mean, if your mower blade is really dull, you might yank them out of the ground. Yeah, right? but, but that's but really but bad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you see that <laughs> happening, you should stop. Yeah, stop. Stop. Yeah. stop. Yeah, don't don't pull very stop far. Stop and sharpen. Right. <laughs> okay, I do want to thank one of our viewers, Burnell. He gave us a great idea for voles, and he said to plant castor beans in the area. Now, hmm. it would be hard to plant them now, but preventative and castor beans do keep moles and voles away. And mine have grown a story high this year. They're beautiful. Yeah. So thank you, Burnell, for that. I really appreciate that. I think that would work. Well, folks, the show is quickly passing us by. Thank you all for being here. We want to thank each of you for watching. We hope you get out there and garden, and we're so glad you watched. Goodbye.